Welcome everybody to Create Inclusive and Accessible OER. Uh, we are lucky enough today to have Josie Gray, the coordinator of collection quality from BC campus. She manages the BC Open Textbook Collection and provides training and support for BC faculty publishing open textbooks and press books. Josie has been learning about and teaching accessibility best practices in OER for three years and has recently started her MDES, Inclusive Design at um, OCAD University. For this uh, session, I'm going to try to pay attention to the chat. So if you do have any questions, feel free to put it in the chat and I will uh, gather those questions and have uh, Josie answer them towards the end. So with that being said, I think Josie can take it away. Hello, thank you so much, Erin, for inviting me to um, give this webinar. It's a topic I really like um, sharing and talking with people with. And thank you, everyone, for taking time out of your day to listen to me talk about accessibility in open educational resources. Um, so before I get started, um, I just wanted to note that all of my slides are under a CC BY license, which means you are free to use, modify, or share this presentation as long as you give me attribution. And at the end of the presentation, I'll be providing a link to where you can download the slides. Okay. Whoops. There we go. So in open education, there are a number of core values guiding the work that we do, um, but one I wanted to highlight right now is access. So a statement that I quite often um, hear about open educational resources is that they are freely accessible online. And in my opinion, when people talk about OER as being freely accessible online, what they really mean is that the book is freely available online. Um, because when I see a statement like that beside a textbook, I usually get really excited. And the first thing I do is check the book's image, images for alt tags. I look for headings and links. And I'm usually disappointed because although I found a really great textbook that is online with editable files and an open license, it isn't accessible. As um, Aaron mentioned, part of my job at BC campus is to manage the BC Open Textbook Collection. And as such, I've reviewed a lot of open textbooks from a lot of different publishers and authors. And when I add a new book to the collection, there is a check that asks, is this textbook accessible? And it's rare that I get to mark that checkbox as a yes. And that isn't surprising. Um, digital accessibility is not something most of us, most if any of us are taught in school. Um, it may not be a default practice for you to be thinking about the accessibility of every digital document that you create. And we also get comfortable in our own ability. And it's easy to forget that what might work for me might not work for someone else. Um, and if thought of it all, accessibility is often still coming in as an afterthought in the design of open educational resources, and this can cause a lot of problems. Um, not only can it cause problems in the design of the textbook, but it can also make people less likely to ever take any steps to ensure a resource is accessible. Um, when a resource is created without accessibility in mind, it often takes a lot of work to come in after to make it accessible. And often once you get to the end of a long project, going back and spending a bunch of time fixing accessibility might not feel worth it. As someone um, who started her work in digital accessibility by remediating inaccessible open textbooks, I am very sympathetic to this point of view. Uh, remediation takes a lot of work and it can be a frustrating process to have to go back in and find a way to fix things. Um, but universal access to education is something that we say we value in the open education movement and ultimately there's more to access than just putting a resource up for free online. Um, while doing that does wonders for access when we understand access in a general sense without looking too closely at the experience of individual students with a particular textbook. Um, but in a movement that wants to make education open for everyone, including students with disabilities, we have to do a little bit better than that. So here are the general topics that I want to cover today. Uh, we'll start by looking at technical accessibility, which are the web content accessibility guidelines, or um, often referred to as WCAG or WCAG. From there, I want to discuss a few things that go beyond technical accessibility, including universal design for learning and inclusive design. And then finally, I'll be providing a list of all of the resources um, that can assist you in this work. 
So let's start with technical accessibility. Uh, when talking about technical accessibility, I'm referring to Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, or WCAG. So these are the minimum technical requirements that will allow students with disabilities to access all of the information in a digital resource. WCAG is an international digital accessibility standard that is developed and maintained by the W3C Web Accessibility Initiative. WCAG has four main principles. Those are perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And I want to spend a few minutes talking about those first three principles. So the first principle is perceivable, which is the idea that information and user interface components must be presentable to users in ways that they can perceive. So this principle focuses on the content. Basically, all content included in a resource should be perceivable through a user's senses. So that means all information needs to be available through sight, sound, and touch, or available in such a way that assistive technology could be used to translate that content for another sense. So this principle includes things like text alternatives for non-text content, how to handle video and audio, the importance of content being adaptable and distinguishable. The second principle is operable, which holds that user interface components and navigation must be operable. So this principle covers how people can navigate and interact with a resource. For example, functionality must be operable with a keyboard. People need to have enough time to complete tasks. Uh, none of the content um, should be designed so that it causes seizures or physical reactions. And the navigation is easy and makes sense. The third principle is understandable, which holds that information and the operation of the user interface must be understandable. So that means that the text is readable and understandable, the layout of the page is predictable and consistent, and there are features that help users avoid and correct mistakes. So now I wanna look at how these principles can be applied in the design of educational resources more concretely. So let's stock, start with the organization of content, which is basically talking about the use of headings in a resource. Using headings to identify sections and subsections of a document helps readers identify the structure and content of a document. Headings provide a visual cue that helps sighted readers quickly skim through content until they find a section they're looking for. Similarly, if there are headings, it makes it possible for someone using a screen reader to navigate a page or document. A screen reader will not identify bolded or larger text as a heading. By marking up the sections and subsections of a chapter as headings, a screen reader user can skip from heading to heading to get an idea about what the chapter is about, understand how the different sections relate to each other based on the heading levels, and skip to parts that they want to read. Without headings, a screen reader user would be forced to read through the entire chapter through from beginning to end every time they wanted to find specific information on a page. So as such, making sure content is organized under headings and subheadings, and that headings and subheadings are used sequentially um, is really important. So if your last heading was a heading two, your next heading should not be a heading level four or five. Someone using a screen reader can also have all of the links on a page read out to them. For this reason, the text of a link should describe the content of the link, even when read out of the context of the rest of the sentence. So on the right side of the slide, I've provided a collection of examples of accessible and inaccessible links. The first example has click here as the link text. Someone who can see the whole sentence can understand what the click here is referring to. However, if someone using a screen reader, had their device read out all of the links on this slide, all they would hear is the phrase click here and have no idea where that link would take them. The second example shows the web address as the linked text. While this is better than the first example, it can still be confusing when a screen reader reads out the web, a web address, especially if it is long and complicated. The third example is the most accessible as the link text is accessibility toolkit which still makes sense when read out of context of the rest of the sentence. Finally, links should not open into new windows or tabs, as it can be disorienting and confusing if the person, whether they are cited or not, not cited, is not, is not expecting it. However, if it is important that a link open in a new tab or window, you can include that information in the link text. This also applies when linking to different document types, such as PDFs, Word files, or Excel files. Because these formats may have different accessibility barriers and require appropriate software, it is best practice to include the file type in the link text as shown in the last example. 
Now, if the resources you are creating will also be available in print format, you'll also have to provide a way for print users to access the web addresses. Um, there are a few different ways you could do this. One idea would be to put the web address in a footnote or create a page at the end of the resource with a list of all of the links and their web addresses. For tables to be accessible, they have to be marked up correctly. And this means they need a caption, um, heading rows, heading cells, and heading columns must be marked as headings with the correct scope assigned. There should be no merged or split cells, and there should be adequate cell padding. In this example, the table has a caption. The table also has a header row with three cells. These header cells are marked as table headers, and their scope is set to column because they are column headers. I won't go into any more detail here, but if you're inserting tables into the resources you create, you can find more specific directions on how to ensure that the tables are accessible in the Accessibility Toolkits chapter on tables, which I will be providing a link to at the end of this presentation. If your resource includes audio, such as a podcast, interview, recorded lecture, or a song, there should also be a transcript of that audio. So a transcript should include the speaker's names, headings and subheadings, all relevant audio content, including all speech content, as well as relevant descriptions of speech and descriptions of relevant non-speech audio. If your resource includes video, all relevant visual information needs to be conveyed in an audio description or transcript, and all relevant audio information is conveyed via captions or a transcript. So captions are text that is synchronized with the audio in a video. Audio descriptions are for someone who can't see the video and needs descriptions of the visual content that is shown in the video that is not otherwise already being conveyed through the audio. And a transcript would include the same information as an audio transcript, but may also include relevant descriptions of video content or visual content. Paying attention to the use of color and color contrast in web content is important for people who have low or poor contrast vision, who are colorblind, or for those who use a device with a monochrome display. In addition, information should never be conveyed by color alone. So on the slide, I've provided three versions of the same bar graph that is charting student device preferences. The top top left graph uses color to differentiate between students who prefer desktops, smartphones, or laptops. When the same graph is seen in grayscale as shown on the right side, it becomes really difficult to tell which bar corresponds with which category. And this may be a serious barrier for someone who has a hard time differentiating between colors or someone who has printed their resource in black and white. This problem can be resolved by using colors with higher contrast ratios and by adding labels to each bar as shown in the bottom example. If you're looking for a tool to help measure color contrast, I would recommend contrastchecker.com, which allows you to test the contrast between colors and will give you a pass or fail rating based on established WCAG standards. The next number of slides will be focusing on images and different strategies for describing images. When talking about images, we need to make a distinction between decorative images and functional images. Decorative images are images that are primarily used for design and do not de convey content, or they convey content that is already described in the surrounding text. As such, these types of images do not need text descriptions. Functional images are images that convey important non-text content. For functional images, you have to consider what information would be lost if those images weren't available, and this information needs to be provided in a text format. So there are three ways to provide text descriptions for images. You can describe the image in the alt text field. This is sometimes referred to as the alt tag or the alt attribute. You can describe the image in the surrounding text or in a caption, or you can create and link to a long description of the image. When thinking about how to describe images, um, here are some things to keep in mind. In terms of what to describe, focus on the content and purpose of the image. What is the image trying to convey? Um, note that this will likely depend on the audience and the context. In terms of how to describe, um, make sure you are clear, concise, and accurate. Go from general to more specific, 
use words rather than symbols when writing math or scientific expressions and think about who, what, where, when, why of the image. Now let's talk about the different places where you can describe an image. The most common is the alt tag. An alt tag provides a short text alternative for an image that those who are using screen readers can access. The alt tag will also be displayed if images aren't loading due to a weak internet connection. And depending on the tool you're using to create your OER, you will be able to add the alt tag when you upload the image or when you edit the image. When creating an alt tag, there are some things to keep in mind. Um, the text will not appear visually in your resource, but it can be accessed by text-to-speech technology. And second, there is no need to include the words image of or anything like that in the alt tag. A screen reader will announce the presence of an image before reading the content of the alt tag. And finally, alt tags are meant to be short, so they should be kept under 125 characters, which includes spaces and punctuation. And if an image requires a longer description, it should be described in the surrounding text or a long description should be created for the image. You can also use the surrounding text to provide the same information as provided in the image. This is often the best option for complex images because it makes the information available for everyone and not just those using the alt tags. If an image has been adequately described in the caption or surrounding text, you can either provide a few word description of the image in the alt tag or not provide an alt tag for the image. In the image shown here, the caption reads, a stolen woman weaving baskets, which adequately describes the content of the image and therefore an alt tag is not required. Complex images such as charts, graphs, diagrams, and maps, and more will likely require longer, longer descriptions than can fit in an alt tag. In these cases, you will need to create a long description for the image that students who can't see the image can access. For some images, you may be able to describe them in a few sentences or a paragraph, but over the next few slides, I want to highlight different strategies for describing different types of complex images that might be more effective and manageable than a whole bunch of text. The first is to use lists. You can use bulleted and numbered lists to represent information that is presented in pie charts, bar charts, line graphs, and flow charts. You can also use data tables to represent similar information. So for example, you could break a complex table down into smaller, simpler tables. You could use um, data tables to describe, again, bar charts, line graphs, and pie charts as well. Here are two images that look quite similar. Um, they are both line graphs that appear in an introduction to sociology textbook. And I put them here to illustrate how the context and significance of an image needs to be considered when deciding how to describe an image. The image on the, the left shows a line graph that shows the close correlation between the divorce rate in Maine and the United States per capita consumption of margarine. This image was included in the textbook to illustrate that correlation does not equal causation. In this example, the visual trend shown in the graph is more important than the individual data points. The rate at which they fell from 2000 to 2005 doesn't matter as much as the fact that the graph shows them falling and rising at, again at almost exactly the same rate. So instead of replacing this image with a data table, a short description describing the point of the image and the trend of the graph is more useful. The image on the right shows the number of husbands and wives in different stages of family life who described their marriage as highly satisfying. In this case, while the visual of the graph is useful for someone who can see it, it would be quite difficult to describe in words, and the student might be expected to compare and contrast different data points. So the best solution here would be to provide an accessible table that is based on the data provided in the graph. So now I want to transition beyond technical accessibility. Um, up to this point, I've mostly provided a checklist approach to accessibility by giving you a collection of success criteria. So I want to complicate that a little bit by talking about the limitations of accessibility checklists, also universal design for learning and inclusive design, and to think about how we can go about adopting accessible practices. A lot of the accessibility considerations that I've talked about so far are things that can be checked off. So for example, do your images have alt text? Check. Does your table have a caption? Check. 
I've started by focusing on these checklist items because they are concrete and they are easily actionable. In addition, these items make up the very important minimum technical considerations to make sure students with disabilities can access their educational materials. However, a checklist approach to accessibility does have a number of weaknesses. It makes accessibility seem like something that can be fixed later. It does not ensure good design. It does not account for the multiple formats of OER. Um, students face access challenges that are not addressed in standard accessibility checklists, and it does not ensure equal access to learning outcomes. All sorts of things affect the accessibility of a resource, and these things are very much context dependent, and they can vary from student to student and even day to day. For example, a student's day-to-day -day life can affect access. Consider a student who spends an hour on a crowded bus every day commuting to school and, spend long, and spends long days on campus studying. For this student, a heavy print textbook would be really annoying, and they might decide to leave it at home rather than lug it to school. So that's an example of a barrier to access. Another example are differences in digital literacy among students. Many OER are primarily online resources, and for those of us who work on a computer all day, um, it's easy to take for granted our comfort and experience with working with digital content. Even young college students who grew up with smartphones and easy access to the internet may not know how to search a PDF or understand how to take advantage of the different features in Pressbooks or know that a EPUB file can be accessed on their phone. If your students are adult learners, paying attention to digital literacy and comfort using digital materials will be even more important because ultimately a student can't learn well from a resource they don't know how to use or don't like using. Another example is access to technology. Not every student has access to a computer. For example, I know a trade student who only spends a few months of the year in school. They don't have a computer because they usually don't need one. If they want to watch Netflix, they just borrow their roommate's laptop. But this year, this person had a course where the textbook was only available online. So without a personal computer, the student regularly struggled with accessing their textbook. Day-to-day -day life, digital literacy, access to technology, all of these things are very individualized and context dependent. And these are things where OER in particular has the potential to make a real difference. Everyone has a preference in how they would like to access their learning materials and open educational resources that are available in multiple formats make it possible for students to pick the format that they're most comfortable with and works best for them. So for example, the trade student that I mentioned would really have valued a copy they could read on their phone or a print version. Someone who spends long hours on transit would likely prefer a digital copy that they could download on their computer for easy offline access. Someone who likes to annotate their textbooks would probably love PDFs. So by providing students choice, there's a potential to really improve their learning experience. But with multiple formats comes new challenges. Accessibility looks different in a print textbook than it does in a web book, an ebook or a PDF, and if you are providing all of these formats, you have to ensure that students using each format can access the same information. For example, people using a print version will need the web addresses if they are going to be able to access any external resources linked to in your book. And a lot of students still really want a print copy, so that's something to keep in mind when you're considering how much interactive content you want to include in your resource that cannot be printed. The final thing I wanted to highlight is the structure of information. How can you organize and structure your resource um, to make it easy to use and easy to find information and navigate? So that means paying attention to the number of chapters, the titles, the use of sections and subsections, numbering systems, headings, and more. These considerations will vary from resource to resource, um, but the more intentional you are in thinking about structure and organization and navigation, the more useful and powerful your resource will be, which on its own will make it more accessible for students. Part of what I'm talking about here is Universal Design for Learning, or UDL. UDL encourages designing teaching and learning environments and materials and opportunities so that they provide multiple means of engagement, representation, and action and expression for students. This is a huge topic and much more than I could ever cover in one slide, but I did want to highlight the principle of multiple means of representation and what this might look like in open educational resources. So this could include incorporating multiple modalities, including video, audio, and interactive activities. It might also look like making resources available in multiple formats, such as PDF, HTML, or EPUB. 
when we bring all of these things together, um, all of these considerations, all of these practices, what we're really starting to talk about is inclusive design. So inclusive design is design is defined by the Inclusive Design Research Center as design that considers the full range of human diversity with respect to ability, language, culture, gender, age, and other forms of human difference. In inclusive design, one of the most important things is recognizing that people are different, and by designing for differences, we can create things that are more useful and powerful and accessible for everyone. With inclusive design, the work is never really done. It's not a box that you can check off. Um, it is an iterative and ongoing practice. And I get that it can be a lot of work and thinking about accessibility adds another layer to the already complex process of developing and adapting open educational resources. However, as a community that values access, it's something we always need to be thinking about and always striving to improve. For those involved in creating and publishing open textbooks and other OER, think about how you can include accessibility considerations as part of the creation process. Include accessibility in style sheets, in the design format and or, uh, design format and, organi and organize with accessibility in mind from the very beginning. Think about the different ways that students might want to access information and what formats you can make available. For example, think about how you will make sure that students using a print copy and students using a digital copy can access the same information. Oops, jumping again. When it comes time to share the resource with students, make sure that they know how to use it. Are they aware of all of the formats that are available and do they know how to use those formats? Are there features that allow them to customize their experience? Are there tools that allow them to interact with the content in different ways? Thinking, um, think annotation tools or text-to-speech software. And then be open to and encourage feedback from students. Ask them what they liked and didn't like. Did they find any of the sections confusing? Were they able to find information? Did it work on their devices? Ultimately, accessibility and inclusion isn't a one and done kind of a thing. It is not a pass fail. It is a spectrum and it may look differently for each person depending on their context. And that plays into one of the best parts of OER, the ability for us to be able to go in and keep making things better. I wanted to um, highlight the accessibility toolkit, which was published by BC Campus. So this toolkit covers a lot of the same information of what I cover today and often in more detail. It also provides an accessibility checklist that can be useful as well as activities. It also links to a series of webinars on inclusive design that BC Campus hosted last February. Um, so this toolkit can be accessed at opentextbc.ca forward slash accessibility toolkit. And I have also um, collected a full list of resources, a lot of which I've talked about in this presentation and they often go into more detail. Um, so feel free to take a screenshot, but I will also be sharing my slides and this list um, in another document. So you can access them there as well. And that is all. Um, I've put the link to the slides and resources on the slide here, so you can find them at bit.ly forward slash Carl accessibility and I will figure out how to find the chat again and so I can answer some questions. Thank you Josie. Um, I took down some questions that um, I can just relay to you it might be easier. <laughs> um, that would be great. Yeah and if anybody else has any questions you can feel free to uh, pop them in the group chat and we'll make sure that uh, we look through those. There's a few questions. First uh, a question about synchronized captioning. So what softwares facilitate synchronized captioning? Sure um, great question. Um, so there's a lot of different um, services that you can use to create captions for you. Um, so one that BC Campus uses is rev.com and they provide captioning for, they charge $1 US per minute of video. Um, there are other tools that allow you to create captions yourself. There's an Adobe tool and I think there are free tools as well. I'd have to look them up though. Um, another thing that people can do is you, if you upload your videos into YouTube, it will create auto captions. Um, and then you can go in and edit those captions because YouTube isn't, because it's done automatically, it's not always very accurate, um, but it does allow you to go in and fix them up after. So those are a few options. 
Uh, great. Um, uh, this is a question about alt tags. Uh, should you not use uh, alt tag descriptions on images that are considered decorative? Yeah, yes, generally yes. Um, an image that is decorative doesn't need an alt tag description. Um, based on some testing I've done with screen readers, sometimes not including an alt tag causes the screen reader to read out the um, image, image title, which can be confusing, but I don't know to what extent that's regular behavior or just a functionality of this one screen reader. Um, but from what I can tell from my research is that if an image does not contain any um, important information, it does not need an alt tag. Thank you. Uh, so this one is also a little bit about alt tags. For PowerPoint with lots of images and attributions and text blocks under the images, will this annoy someone using a screen reader? So would a screen reader read the alt tags and the text blocks under each image? That's a great question. Um, accessibility in PowerPoint can be pretty um, complex. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that with PowerPoint, um, you have to use uh, specific content types. So a text box, if you just add a text box, a screen reader will not read out the content of that text box unless you add um, alt text. So for example, in my slides, um, I provide alt text for the images and um, text that has been added that conveys information on the slide is added using the text content type in PowerPoint. And then for the attributions that I've added, I put them in text boxes and then I don't provide the an alt text for those. So a screen reader wouldn't read those. Um, if you're looking for more information on accessibility in PowerPoint, I did a webinar in February um, where I talked about it in a lot, in a lot more detail. Um, so that webinar can be accessed. If you go to the link that I have on the slide, um, there's a list of resources and you find the inclusive design webinar series. And one of those uh, webinars is on PowerPoint specifically. Great, thank you. What would you recommend for writing math equations since many systems like LaTeX are inaccessible to screen readers? That's a great question and still something that um, I am working on or figuring it out. Um, so you're right, LaTeX often is not accessible for screen readers. Um, however, MathML is accessible for screen readers. Um, okay. So yeah, MathML. Great. Um, I think uh, Dan DeMillo had a question about uh, giving an idea of what a screen reader may sound like for someone reading a textbook, and I think somebody gave him an example, which is great. Um, yeah, I would definitely look into examples available online. I think you should be able to find lots of recordings. Um, people who use screen readers are often, they can listen to the information on the screen extremely quickly. It's quite incredible to listen to someone used to using a screen reader use it. So I just want to thank you, Josie, for a great presentation. Um, doing accessibility right at the beginning, of course, is the best approach, but I think in the library often we're, we're retrofitting a lot of projects. Absolutely, so, yeah. So yeah, so it's good to have this in mind, and I really suggest taking a look at that accessibility toolkit from BC Campus. It's phenomenal. We use it at UBC all the time. So thank you very much. Um, thank you for having me. So thank you, everybody. And we hope to see you at our future webinars.